Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about growing nutrient-dense foods and med- medicinal plants, such as perhaps medical marijuana and soil that is rich in polyphenols and flavonoids, if you'd like to harvest, that's bright-colored, has lots of flavor, and full of antioxidants. On the program today, we're joined by founder and president of Geo Growers, which has been around for more than 20 years, which quickly became known for its high-performance quality soil blends that are science-based. He found the company that he founded became the go-to source and knowledge base for ecologically based landscape, garden, and food production systems. He's also presented the latest research on the role of trace minerals within living systems and biologically based agriculture. So if you're someone who's interested in growing, becoming a great gardener, this is the man you want to listen to. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, George Altgelt. George, thank you for being on the program today. Thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, it's pretty exciting when you talk about this. Uh, a lot of people think soil, well, you know, how exciting is that? But there's really a lot to this here, isn't there? Right, right. Dirt is not just dirt. It's the living medium. It's what plants depend on to get everything they need so they can grow and reproduce. Now, uh, as I was uh, opening the program, the word polyphenol came up. Now, what exactly is that? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, uh, Polyphenols, almost all of them, are founded on the trace mineral copper. But, of course, all the trace minerals are required, the molybdenum, the zinc, you know, the uh, boron especially. Uh, These are the things that polyphenols are what the plant depends on to build frame. Lignin, which is a very, very stout uh, hydrocarbon, uh, is made from uh, polyphenols. And again, copper is the mineral that's the foundation of that. Now, if all of the trace minerals are abundant, the plant can go beyond building frame. Um, Of course, it requires... You know, it requires fats and sugars and carbohydrates and proteins, especially proteins. Um, But once the plant has an abundant supply of nutrition, especially trace minerals, it can build the so-called secondary plant metabolites. And um, many of those are the polyphenols. Now, I don't want to run anybody short here. There's the terpenoids. There's the benzenoids. uh, There's the fatty acid derivatives, um, you know, and then there's the phytoalexins. Now, phytoalexins are produced by the plant so it can defend itself. Basically, phytoalexins are the chemicals that a plant makes all on its own as an immune response to, say, for instance, some kind of pathogen. It's a fungus, you know, or let's say some kind of a pest. Uh, Once the pest lands on the leaf and takes a bite or, you know, sticks that little piercing nozzle it has into the cell to drink it dry, which is what red spider does, um, the plant will produce um, phytoalexins, a whole array of immune response chemicals. And these are not toxic, uh, you know, to us. We're not talking about spraying the plant with something toxic to kill the bug. This is what the plant can do and will do if its nutrition is uh, adequate to abundant. Uh, This is something that happens naturally. It's been going on for millions of years. And anytime you see uh, a pest problem on a plant, it's usually an indication that it cannot defend itself. It's not making the the, uh, polyphenols, the terpenoids, the benzenoids, and all the fatty acid derivatives. That's just not something it can do right then. That's why when you start out, you want for all of these things to be available, and that's usually going to be in the soil. And, you know, great strides have been made in the hydroponics form of agriculture, but so far it hasn't come close to what soil can provide for plants in the way of the so-called secondary plant metabolites. So it sounds like plants are in a situation uh, that they're able to defend themselves? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, I'll give you a a macro example. 
uh, in Africa, um, there's a, t a certain, there are a lot of things that elephants like to eat. Um, one of them is elephant bush. Uh, we grow those as succulents here in the States, and they're really pretty and interesting. Um, but there's a lot of things that elephants eat, and as soon as they find a nice stand of whatever sumptuous vegetable it is that they would like to graze on, from the moment they take the first bite, that plant starts changing its chemistry. It starts making itself less palatable. And it does more than that. It sends the signal downstream via airflow to tell all the other plants that, as Jerry Brunetti likes to say, the boys are in town. You can't run away. You better do something. Mm -hmm. And that's when they do. They start making the polyphenols. Uh, uh, um, a more surprising incident is the uh, uh, there's a uh, an experiment that was done on tobacco, and the tobacco was surrounded by um, um, uh, a plant that produced uh, the terpenoids from chaparral, and the chaparral was um, clipped so that it started producing its own polyphenolic response. Well, that signal got sent to the tobacco plants, and the tobacco plants responded by making enormous amounts of nicotine. They made so much nicotine that the worms began to drop dead right off the tobacco plant. And that was from an unrelated plant simply sending the signal that something had gone wrong. Wow, that sounds uh, pretty crazy about how this all gets communicated so efficiently. It makes, you know, plants, obviously, you take a look and you think, wow, they've got a real, uh, quite a bit going on there, don't they? Yes. Yeah, the, uh, yeah there's so much going on that we've just now recently discovered. Um, you know, the, the the ability of plants to defend themselves is amazing, and we really had no idea until just the last... 15, 20 years, because we haven't had the um, analytical capacity to really look at this. Um, you know, the, the post-infective inhibitants, you know, the glycosinates and the cyanides and all of these uh, systemically activated resistance chemicals, that's all just come to light in the last 15, 20 years. And, um, and it's, it's astounding and every plant does this, and you can make sure that it can do this for you, for the sake of the crop you're trying to grow, whether it's, you know, tomatoes or peppers and onions or, or whatever. They can do this because nutrition is abundant. And that's, uh, that's where good soil comes in. And you, you can have all of the trace minerals required, but let's say the pH is too alkaline. A young plant can't do much to change the pH of the soil around its roots. And if the soil is alkaline, it cannot take up copper. That's one of the first things that drops out of the absorption spectrum is copper when soil is too alkaline. However, as that plant matures, it exudes more carbon dioxide around its roots, mixes with the moisture, becomes carbonic acid, begins lowering the pH into the acid zone, and an acidic soil at about 6.5, and that's not terribly acidic, but an acidic soil can now release the copper so the plant can absorb it. That's the difference between young plants and older established plants. And it's you know always something to bear in mind. You want to get your, your youngsters, especially if they're transplants, you want to get those um, with all of the trace minerals required so they can, from the very beginning, produce frame and produce the polyphenols and you know the terpenoids benzenoids and everything else uh, that's that's why it's important to have a, a soil that's got that in it to start with now uh, as you were talking about the production of polyphenols uh, these things become built over time what would uh, actually stop or change the uh, production of polyphenols well, insect attack is one of the things that changes the type and quantity of polyphenols. Um, but let's say uh, you're a grape grower, and you've got this idea in your head that, um, you know, 
they're doing so well, grapes are doing so well in Europe where they have, you know, as much limestone as we have. And so let's say you trench uh, a limestone hill and you grind up all the limestone into fine powder and then you plant your grapes in that because that is, after all, what they've done in Europe. Well, they never did really run trenchers through limestone. What they did is they planted grapes in whatever soil they did have and then year after year after year after year, they started manuring those crops, building the soil up, making sure that there was good organic matter and an influx of nutrients going into those plants. Some of those vineyards are centuries old, uh, and the plant has every advantage. It's made the soil around its roots more acidic, and then the, the farmers from many generations back have been manuring those fields and also adding other organic matter and do it for um, you know not just grapes but um, olives for example and other fruits they're all getting um, a carefully managed feeder root zone and that's overlooked often in situations here in the states where you've got a new crop you know you think you know what the plant needs uh, and then you don't get much production and so here's the solution commonly and not one that I agree with, but you start to put on nitrogen. And yeah, the plant grows like crazy. And the simple fact is that plant cannot refuse nitrogen. Water-soluble nitrogen is going to be absorbed by the plant no matter what. And the uptake of minerals, trace minerals in particular, falls behind. When that happens, the plant is not adequately nourished to produce the polyphenols, and all the other plant chemical defense materials. So you might get a lot of grapes uh, that don't have any taste, and boy, did they have insect and fungus problems. You were spraying constantly, especially fungus problems. Whereas if you grew the grapes more slowly with the whole complement of trace minerals, uh, you might never encounter uh, a pathogenic fungi or an insect attack of some sort. And that's the difference between uh, knowing what the plant needs, you know, feed the plant, feed the soil. That's where that comes from. Um, and, and then, you know, all the other factors that are part of how to grow a healthy plant that's robust and able to defend itself. Wow, it's, it's just really incredible to think about all this, you know, that as we get involved with it, we seem to actually cause more problems than we think we're solving, don't we? Yes, um, you know, it, it, there's an interesting evolution uh, of that. Um, during the First World War, the, the Germans discovered that their nitrate explosives uh, would serve as nitrogen for crops in the field. And the First World War, World War I, went on about two, maybe three years later than it should have because they had this abundant production of um, grains in particular, and they could make bread. Uh, Germans are big on rye bread, and they had lots of ways to make bread. So it kept them, uh, you know, it, it kept their armies fed, um, uh, you know, <laughs> for a while longer than anyone thought possible. Well, that same strategy of using nitrate explosive and putting it in the soil was yielding higher yields and um, that sort of was taking hold then, but after World War II, there was a lot of nitrates that were left over from the war. And that's when we really started using nitrates as fertilizer, as a nitrogen, uh, in a big way. Really took you know, precedent over any other traditional farming. Well, in the beginning, that worked really well. And the reason it worked so well is because the, um, the soil was still loaded with carbon. And in particular, um, uh, humus material that provides humic acid and fulvic acid, and it transports those trace minerals into the plant. So the plants weren't too bad off when it came to the absorption of trace minerals. But as more and more nitrates were used to fertilize crops, it was using up the carbon that was in the soil. And the carbon was not being replaced. 
in the old days, you would plant a so-called green manure crop. You would have something like winter rye planted in the field, and you would plow it under. It basically kills the winter rye, but all that organic matter starts to rot and break down in the soil. Well, nobody thought how important that might be later, and they just stopped doing it because the yields were like bumper crops with all the nitrate-type fertilizer. But as the carbon was used up, production began to fall, and that's when you began to have uh, a real need for some kind of rescue chemistry because the plants were not making the polyphenols and all the plant defense chemicals. All they were doing was growing and producing, and they were short on trace minerals. So once the trace minerals dropped away, so did the plant defense chemicals. So you wound up using more nitrate fertilizer and more plant rescue toxic chemistry, you know, toxic rescue chemistry is basically what it's called. Uh, and it's to the point now that um, crops are very, very mineral deficient and very, very dependent on chemical farming. And a great deal of it is toxic, the toxic chemical load in ag, in ag foodstuffs conventionally raised has just been steadily going up. And we're seeing the results. You know, the cancer rate is climbing. You know, went from 40% from a few years ago, 42%. It's probably higher than that now. But that's what we're looking at. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because I was uh, just recently watching a documentary and they were talking about that and plants. And they said, you know, when you take a look at plants and nature, they build their own systems to protect from outside invaders. And when you realize that all of a sudden now we've changed, especially our agricultural growing, to the point where we actually have uh, what they call them, uh, uh, they're modified, the plants, so they're able to spray them with pesticides and they're able to withstand the pesticide spray, but this is also to prevent the bugs from coming to get them. And you think to yourself, just using reason alone, this just doesn't make any sense as to how this actually is good for us in the long run. Yeah, you do start to think about that, and more and more people are thinking about it. Uh, the one publication that's keeping up with those kind of changes, and also reporting on the uh, brand new renaissance, which is basically going back to uh, putting carbon in the soil, going back to organic methods. That publication is called Acres USA. And I encourage everyone hearing this to just Google Acres USA and get you a subscription uh, and just start receiving the magazine. You will be so happy at all the really nice, sensible changes that are taking place in agriculture right now. Uh, the, they've, all, they've already proven that organically grown corn will outproduce the hybrids. We're talking about organically grown corn on the open pollinated, non-hybrid corn varieties. They're actually outproducing conventional grown corn of any kind. And, you know, that, that was always a point of contention. It's like, oh, you are organic folks, you'll never keep up with an actual need. Well, the actual truth of that is it's the conventional folks that are falling behind. And it's the people who are doing it organically with open pollinated. They're the ones who are actually showing that it can be done, and it can be done abundantly and profitably. Well, that's very encouraging to know that. Do you see the industry as a whole actually moving in this direction now? We've been seeing the industry as a whole move in that direction for some time. This is the only industry, if you want to call it that. I mean, you have to more or less. Uh, the organics, the push for purchasing organics is causing that market to increase anywhere from 15% to 20% a year. Nothing else is doing that. Nothing else is performing at that rate. The only thing that would match it would be a brand new magazine publication that's out in the marketplace. And that's a tiny, tiny little piece of the market. We're talking about agriculture. We're talking about vast tracts of land are now moving in the direction of organics. And it's the, the know-how has accumulated, the expertise has accumulated to the point that transitioning to organics 
is less and less of a problem and has more and more appeal because you're reducing the cost of inputs to produce that crop. And, it, and it's really a revolution. Uh, that's the only way I can say it. Get your subscription to Acres USA, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Very good. You know, one thing I'm curious about, and I'm sure the listeners are uh, kind of curious, is uh, how to know if you're a grower uh, whether or not the seed stock they get is going to uh, produce anything. That's an excellent question, and it's something I've oftentimes wanted to address because here's the magic of it. If the soil is fully nutrified and when the plant in that soil is able to take up those nutrients, and it depends on biology as much as it depends on the actual nutrients being in the soil. If the biology is right, the uptake is a marvel to behold, and what's really a marvel is to watch that seed stock reach its full genetic potential. And I'll I'll give you a really sweet example. at, uh, there's a local no- restaurant here called Rolling in Time and Dough, and we donated all the soil for their garden that supplies the restaurant. They planted, this has been about oh, eight years ago, they planted sunflowers. And these sunflowers normally reach a height of six to seven feet. In my soil, they reached somewhere between 11 feet, 11 inches, and 12 feet, 2 inches, and that's not counting the flower. That's just counting the stalk from the ground to where the flower head begins to bend it. And I got a picture of it. This beautiful young woman standing there with her arm outstretched. She's showing the the flowers that she can't possibly reach in these 12-foot sunflowers with these huge sunflower heads. That was a good example of reaching full genetic potential. Now, if you're a sunflower grower, you probably don't want to grow anything that tall because the harvesting machines are not set up for it. But this was just, you know, plants being grown for the heck of it in some place. Just by, you know, let's grow sunflowers. That was basically how that happened. And surprised everybody. 12-foot-tall sunflowers. And um, got photographs to show it. It's really, really nice. Very sweet. Hey, you know, it's just pretty awesome to think about all this. Is uh, uh, you know, when you tend to let things just go back to the way they were naturally, and um, you know, when it comes to doing this, and our people listening here today, how does a grower know what market they're approaching and providing for? Especially if uh, you're someone who's thinking about getting in the CBD market. Exactly. Um, The first thing I've always recommended is you want to get a test. And you want to use a reputable lab. And I'm going to say Texas Plant and Soil Lab in Edinburgh, Texas. Google them. You'll get their number. You'll get everything you need to know. But these people know what's available to the plant because the reagents that they use to make that determination, that reagent is carbonic acid. There are other places, especially academic establishments, they'll use hydrochloric acid. That's not what a plant exudes from its roots. And you're going to get skewed information. Plants don't excrete hydrochloric acid. They excrete CO2. That becomes carbonic acid. If you want to know what's available to the plant, use a lab that uses that technique. They'll also give you organic recommendations. They'll say, your soil is woefully short in sulfur. Now, plants love sulfur, and you've got to have sulfur. It's not to be concerned of having too much sulfur unless you, you know, really pour it on. Don't do that because then you're going to have sulfur-digesting bacteria taking over. You want just enough. Go with their recommendations, and it'll be just right. And they'll make recommendations for every nutrient, whether it's micro nutrients or the macro stuff like the zinc you know calcium is also very very important you want to look at what's available to the plant you know you don't want to have too much of anything good soil is in a state of balance and you can nutrify soil so heavily that it's choked and clogged with uh, all kinds of minerals and it's absolutely the opposite direction you want to go in 
Not to mention the fact that if you're the one adding the amendments and putting in the inputs, you only want to put in what's necessary to make that crop healthy and abundant. You don't want to go beyond that. For one, uh, ex inputs are expensive, and farming has always been risky business. You can lose your shirt so fast with farming, and I know because I grew up around it. You know, it's like, you know, the, you got the price of cattle is 10 cents a pound on the hoof at the auction. What's going on there? And then the next thing you know, the hamburger at the grocery store goes from 35 cents a pound to 50 cents a pound. And the guys on TV all get on there and tell you it's because the, the ranchers are gouging the public, which was the furthest thing from the truth. Because I went through that era. I went through that, and I asked my mom and dad. I asked my grandmother and grandfather. I asked all my uncles. They all raised cattle. I said, what are you getting at the auction? He said, I can't believe it. We're not getting enough to even haul the animals over there. And it's like, so who's catching the blame? The, the people producing it, and they're going broke. You know, these markets are, you know, fickle and manipulated. I don't like to say that, but it's true, and it was a hard reality when I went through it as a you know late teenager early 20s i got a front row seat to see how crazy it all was that's why i'm telling you you want to get a soil analysis and you want to put the inputs that count and you don't want to waste your money this is really important because you can go broke fast farming and ranching oh that's you know it's a uh, very uh exciting to hear about those kind of things so basically really do your homework and know what you're getting into that's for sure so and that's why i recommend the lab you know mm -hmm. you get you a good lab like texas plant and soil lab what you get from them you can hang your hat on that at the end of the day because it's a real lab doing real work now uh we were talking about things that kind of work against plants, and certainly pests are one of them. What would you say are the two most prevalent pests that confront people who are growing? Well, um, there are lots of pests, but I want to tell you that red spider is one of the most formidable pests, and it's not an insect. It's an arachnid. Tiny little thing. It gets its um, sustenance by sucking the cell dry. And, it, you know, the common red spider and the two-spotted red spider, those are the ones that are formidable. And I'll, give you, I'll tell you how this can happen with tomatoes. You plant your tomatoes, and let's say you had good sense to water them as soon as you stuck them in the ground. And then they start to develop. They get bigger. Next thing you know, you're watering real often. And then one day you skip watering, and that plant wilts. That's when the red spider moves in, and you'll be fighting red spider till the end of the season. Um, unless you use something like, and this is commonly available, um, all seasons oil spray. It's a dormant oil you can use year-round, no matter how hot it is. You spray that on there, and it's not poison. It coats the little creature and they suffocate because they can't absorb oxygen once you put that oil on them. But I'm telling you, you want to keep that stress away from the plant so that they don't come in and take over. They're always in the environment. They're opportunists. But once you wilt that plant, that's, that's it. That's the open door. They come in, take over, and just they can devastate any crop you have. Cucumbers in particular are uh, susceptible to red spider. And, you know, the, the, they got stronger and stronger pesticides to put on them. Um, and, you know, the brand new pesticides, they work, but you're contaminating the food that you're trying to produce. That's why, I, you know, I, I keep wanting you to stay on top of it. Make sure the plant is abundantly nourished. Um, I, I, here, okay, let's go to the other side of the spectrum, grasshoppers. Uh, it doesn't matter how organic your garden is a grasshopper will eat it you know probably if it's organic so much the better but here's how you stop a grasshopper you, you sprinkle and you do this with uh, uh, something that disperses diatomaceous earth with air and you put this light coating of diatomaceous earth now diatomaceous earth is 
uh, a tiny single-celled organism once upon a time, and it had an almost pure silica skeleton. And that silica is hard, hard, hard. Hard as sand, but it's also sharp. When a grasshopper eats a leaf that's got diatomaceous earth on it, it ruins its mandibles. Uh, and it rubs a hole in the mandibles, and it rubs holes all in the exoskeleton of the grasshopper and other insects as well. And the next thing you know, the grasshopper desiccates and dies because, uh, you know, its mouth parts stopped working and it got holes in its uh, outside skeleton, and it just loses all of its moisture and it dies. That's a great way to handle it. And you can, uh, they've got these uh, air pumps that just blow the diatomaceous earth out there. Then you've got the stuff called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's called BT for short. Um, you apply that, and it gives the worm or caterpillar a stomachache. They can't digest their food, and then they start to die from starvation. And it's not toxic to us, not unless you eat it and don't eat it. You know, you rinse this stuff off of your tomatoes or peppers. Um, and it's not particularly toxic even if you eat it, but it will lacerate your own intestinal flora, so I don't recommend that you eat it. But there's a lot of different things. i, I give you a, a, a quick background on that. When I was a kid, my grandparents on my mother's side, they used seven dust for everything. And, uh, and my grandfather on my father's side uh, who was a botanist, incidentally, and studied diseases of sugarcane in Cuba. Um, he said early on, this is before he ever went to Cuba, he said, if seven dust will do that to an insect, what's it doing to us? And he never would use it. And it was, everybody was recommending it. It was just miracle stuff. He never would use it. And and he started, you know, his family out on organically grown uh, produce from the home garden, and he was organic before it was ever cool to be organic. And that's kind of the background where I come from. And, you know, every, every other generation emulates the generation of the grandparent. And that's basically what's happening. Well, it's just it's pretty incredible to think how easy it is to go the different direction, you know, that's uh, most natural and uh, actually you know, prevent a lot of this from happening. It's going to happen anyway, but generally, you know, as plants are stronger and able to do what they do, uh, that's something to pay attention to because when they're weaker and sicker, that's where the bugs kind of come in, isn't it? Yes, it is. And, you know, there's exceptions to that rule, and I want to mention one of them. There was a fellow in Boston who decided he was going to take the gypsy moth, which had a huge larva, and cross it with a silkworm moth, and he was going to get these giant silkworm cocoons and revolutionize the um, silkworm industry for gathering silk. Well, um, his experiment failed, and the gypsy moth got away. And it's sometimes referred to as the moth that ate New England. And <laughs> the gypsy moth likes to eat the center out of a growing tip on a pine tree. And the the problem was so bad and so widespread in New England that um, they decided to spray. And I'm pretty sure they were spraying with malathion. And the next thing you know, there's so many dead animals in the forest that people became alarmed and said, stop this, it's crazy. So they did. And they found other things to use. They actually used Bacillus thuringiensis, which was not toxic to the animals. But in the long run, here's what was discovered. The gypsy moth is an opportunist, and it has periods of boom and bust. Is, you know, and like here in Texas, you've got these uh, little caterpillars that eat oak trees, live oaks in particular, and there's like, you can't even walk under an oak tree because they're all dangling down on a little silk thread. Um, and then people get all alarmed, and they think they should be spraying something. And fortunately, they knew about BT, and they, they would spray that. But it's just like the gypsy moth. It's boom and bust. There's a lot of them for a while, and then they go away. I watched grackles flying underneath the live oaks, eating these little worms on the wing, 
just darting back and forth, just and then you know get them a you know a bunch, and then they'd come back and they were just filling up on them. This is grackles, you know, a common bird around you know cities and towns, and you know, and, and it followed that whole thing of boom and bust. Now there aren't any of those. You don't see them, but don't worry, they'll come back. Um, and and then you know they didn't kill the live oaks. Um, got something else killing the live oaks called oak wilt, which I've, I've been working on for a while now too. Um, but that's a whole other story. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I guess what it comes down to too is if it comes time to where someone needs to treat their infested crops with chemicals, how do they know when to do that? And what's a great way to prevent, let's say, an infestation from beginning in the first place? Well. To prevent the infestation in the first place is to make sure your plants are adequately nourished. Now, in time, the insect will find a way to get past that. Um, like, like, you know, well, no one's raising live oaks as a crop. You would think they would think about it that way sometimes, but uh, at the moment, no. But if you've got a crop and it gets an infestation, um, you know, of course, I mentioned a couple of different alternatives. There's the all seasons oil spray. It's a dormant oil you can use in hot weather. There's the Bacillus thuringiensis, which you mix with water and spray it on. It's called Dipel. Um, and then there's the whole thing of the plant. If you wait and watch and don't disrupt the plant's chemical defense, you may see, and quite often this is the case, you may see this huge decline in the pest. And it's going through that cycle of boom and bust. You know, yeah, we lost a lot of, um, of let's say, cotton to cotton to boll weevils, but next year it wasn't nearly so bad. And the only time it's really bad is if you sprayed the boll weevils and everything that was predating boll weevils died because they were eating poisoned boll weevils. That's a problem. You know, I, somebody sprayed, the, there's this uh, auto dealership here in Austin, Texas, and just as a matter of course, they sprayed the whole thing with diazinon. Well, I'm over there, um, you know, we've been shopping for a car, and there's all these dead robins that are just uh, all over the grounds, dead robins. And I asked about it, and he said, oh, yeah, we sprayed the place with diazinon. Shouldn't have killed the robins. Well, it contaminated the earthworms that the robins were eating, and it didn't take too many earthworms to kill a robin. That was sad. And there was, in my estimation, no real reason to spray that, the grounds with poison, except somebody sold the idea to whoever was managing. And so there's, you know, dead birds all over the place that ordinarily would not be dead. Yeah, so I don't know if I've answered the question. I mean, there's all no, absolutely. You're talking about how you started with one thing and then you end up breaking something else, which could have actually fixed the thing that you were trying to uh, fix in the first place. <laughs> right, so. right. Yeah, the 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 little worms that come cascade downward from live oaks. Boy, the the grackles love it. You see grackles out in the country eating those things, and they're normally grackles are all in town. Now, you know, last but not least, there's definitely a big surge and boom in what's known as the cannabis industry here. So what would you say uh, are the economic implications when it comes to the hemp industry? The economic implications are enormous. For the first time, we've got a crop that's actually going to turn into cash that's actually going to benefit the farmer. He's not going to be on the very edge of breaking even, like, for instance, the way corn has come. You know, anybody that owns land is, you know, planting corn right up to the front steps on their porch. Um, and, and even then, it's, it's a toss-up as to whether or not you'll make any money because you have this enormous outlay of equipment and, you know, all the inputs, uh, you know, those are expensive the you know the nitrate fertilizer and this and that and you know and if the crop starts to succumb to some kind of insect attack or fungal attack you've got those inputs to pay for cannabis doesn't really have uh, 
you know, any natural enemies. It's highly fibrous. Nothing's going to eat it for very long, and it's just going to say, well, I've had enough of this. Let's find something else to eat. Um, and then the, in, in the, let's say, the CBD oil industry, that sells for a very uh, nice price, a real price. It's actually on a par with what other things should sell for and what other things do sell for. So you're going to have a farmer who's actually going to make some money. The way cotton farmers did in the early 1950s, man, you could make money on cotton because you nobody cared to spray the bow weevil. It's like, yeah, they, they eat a certain amount, and so what? You know, I still made $30,000 on my acreage, and in 1958, that was a lot of money. This is what can happen now, uh, provided, of course, that the industry is not taxed to death. Uh, all of the farmers out there need to get together and, you know, dare I say it, form a lobby and stop the overtaxation of that product. You could overtax it beyond its productive value and drive it out of the country, you know, drive it back into Mexico. Uh, you know, heaven forbid we should get uh, CBD oil from China, you know, contaminated with God knows what, you know, smelter slag, who knows? I wouldn't trust it for as far as I could throw a chunk of it. But it's like we've really got a chance for farmers to actually make some money. Like, for instance, tobacco farmers uh, in Kentucky and Tennessee. The price supports have always been there for tobacco. It makes it a profitable crop to raise. Now, uh, let, let me just clear the air. I don't, I don't smoke tobacco. I don't smoke um, uh, marijuana. I'm not interested in any of that because um, it's, it's just, you know, on a habitual basis, these things are damaging. However, CBD oil has got lots of benefits, and there's no reason not to, you know, rub it on your sore shoulder or what have you. Um, you know, I won't even go into that. Uh, there's plenty of information out there for that. But the tobacco industry has always had the price supports for an array of reasons. One, we don't want far tobacco farmers to go broke because they're supplying a world market. And, you know, and who knows, you know, lots of um, senators and congressmen smoke tobacco, cigars and what have you. Uh, you know, they don't want to see that go away in spite of the anti-smoking campaign um you know I, I all i want to say is it's time for farming to be profitable it needs to be profitable you need to have farmers back out on the land that's what the organic movement is doing it's taking a, <clears throat> a lot of farmers back out uh out of the city where they're not real happy got their families out there they've got ducks and geese they've got the great pyrenees puppy dog that looks after the, you know, looks after the chickens, you know, keeps the coyotes at bay. You know, lots of wonderful things are happening. And uh, people want that kind of produce, whether it's eggs or cheese or meat or vegetables from the garden. They want that stuff that's not contaminated. And there's this huge surge in that direction. And some conventional spokesman can say, oh, well, it hasn't been proven that this is more nutritious than conventional. You don't have to prove it. We already know that it's more, you know, it's, it's mineral rich. It's endowed with dense nutrition. Uh, but your intuition alone tells you this is better. And I got a feeling that's true because of the way it tastes. I ate a turnip that I didn't want to turn loose of it. I ate it right down to the nubbies. As this guy that uses my soil growing turnips and he yanked one out of the ground dusted it off and handed it to me i've never tasted a turnip in my life that tasted as good as that did man i wanted to have a whole bowl full of them sitting around you know i'm glad you brought that up too uh because there were two things when you get these people you always get these advocates out there that think they have professional decrees you know and you look toward the end you know what's motivating you who's paying you to go out and talk this nonsense and, and again you don't have to be a scientist. You don't even have to be a farmer. All you got to do is apply reason to this. So all these millions of years, these plants were doing these things all on their own. They would thrive, and sometimes they would die, but it was all in cycles. That's just how it is. 
But in the yep. end, when you take a look at the end result of what we're doing today and you realize, well, if you go back to pre-industrial agriculture, uh, when you had farmers doing things naturally, they had to kind of deal with the elements you know, and the changes and the cycles. But in the end, it all seemed to balance itself out. But what you didn't have was a lot of disease, especially cancer. I mean, cancer was one of the yeah. really, really, really rare things, uh, almost like lightning striking a tree in front of you sort of a thing. But nowadays, it's an epidemic. And, you know, here all this money is being spent on research for this. But of the millions, even billions of dollars over 50-plus years of research, they haven't been any closer to a cure now than they even were then. So obviously they're not very motivated for a cure in this. Well, that's fine. If that's the industry <laughs> you want to be in, then by all means you go ahead and you make people believe that you're actually doing anything. But in the end, let's get back to what you were talking about, and that is taste. I remember just a few years ago I had a neighbor. He uh, was doing his own gardening, and he brought me a watermelon and a nice little thing of tomatoes. And when I bit into that tomato, I said to my wife, this is the first time I tasted a tomato that reminded me of when I was a kid, that it had that tomato taste that when you taste this, it's very distinct. It has just this wonderful, deep, smoky taste to it. And, uh, and his watermelon was exactly the same thing. You know, I hadn't tasted a watermelon like that since I was a kid. And these were, yeah, so it's amazing when you talk about just that alone, that's what the plant's trying to do for the most Absolutely. part. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. it is here, we're in symbiosis. Plants and animals can't exist without each other, you know. And so it's amazing what a plant is willing to do uh, to be sure that that happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me corroborate your story here for a moment. Um, uh, most of my adult life, well, all my life, uh, I never liked cantaloupe, and I couldn't understand why anyone would eat a cantaloupe. And a friend of mine, who grows everything organically, came to the place where I was working, and that was the natural gardener here in Austin, Texas. And he brought everybody a little sample of cantaloupe that he had grown in his garden. And it was, you know, it was all prepped. It was cut up. It was even separated, uh, you know, very carefully sliced away from the skin. And he handed me a sack full, and I said, oh, no, that's okay, Bear. You know, I, I have never liked cantaloupe. And he stood there holding it out, and he said, well, try this. I did. I took a bite of that. I ate the whole thing. I was asking him for more. I have never tasted cantaloupe in my life until I ate what he grew organically. Yeah. You know, and it's like going back to the tomato I'm uh, describing. When you look at tomatoes, at least over the many years I've seen them, they're kind of white in the middle, they're real dense. They didn't have that liquidy tomato deep red color on the inside. I mean, there was just, when you've tasted a tomato like I'm talking about, you'll know exactly what I, it, the taste never goes away. And then you look at this stuff that we put on our burgers or in salads and you go, uh, <laughs> you know, how much is colorless? <laughs> you know, I'm not a vegetarian. I, I like, you know, a full array of, you know, kind of a thing. But I do love good vegetables, and in fact, you know, even my wife and I are getting closer to eating more raw now because there's a lot of wonderful YouTube channels that, to me, I think really support a lot of what you're talking about. And if you want to become vegetarian or vegan, hey, fantastic. You know, as long as you're happy and healthy, that's all that matters. But you can also enjoy the taste of things as well. And so you, you see the YouTube industry has really done – you know, a lot of great, a lot of good, because you're seeing a lot of these people come out and show you how to do all this and why it makes sense. And, and I think that's just really fantastic all the way around. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one of the things that the organic uh, produce is eliminating, and especially just foods in general, you're eliminating the need to add uh, the so-called um, MSG mimics. Uh, you know, you've got... Oh, I don't know how many things there are now. Uh, hydrolyzed yeast extract, that's an MSG mimic. Uh, you know, hydrolyzed plant protein, that's another one. Anything, anytime you see the word natural flavors, there's about a 90% chance it's an MSG mimic. Well, when you start producing foods like the ones you and I have been talking about, there's no need to add that. Uh, that food is going to taste 
beyond great from the moment you bite into it. And, you know, we're moving in that direction. It's very heartening to see it. And, uh, and I, know, I know, you know, a lot of people that are listening to us right now know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and here's a wild one, too. I think this is a fun story. I was actually involved with a golf tournament one time. And uh, so the other two that we were paired up with were, you know, going along, we're playing our game. And, I, you know, on one of the fairways, there was this apple tree that was just off to not necessarily the center of it, but it was a dog leg. And it had these large apples. And so one of the guys goes over, picks one off the tree and eats it. And, and I could just listen to him and think, man, that actually sounds good. And I said, so how's that apple? He says, it's awesome. So I picked one up, and I can't remember the last time I tasted an, an apple that good. But look, the tree's out there in the middle. They're not bothering it, you know. And it was just <laughs> producing this beautiful fruit. I mean, that's not the kind of apple. Usually apples, they taste like sawdust and water for the most part. But this thing was just like, oh, my goodness. I mean, you could just imagine apple pies with this thing. But you right. know, it's, just, it's pretty amazing to think about what we can do. It. And I'm so encouraged when I hear you say that the industry is changing, and hopefully in a very good and aggressive way, to just get rid of a lot of this nonsense that we've got out there, you know, of chemicals and things being produced, uh, because I think they're just being way overused, and we're not understanding the nature of things, and that's where we need to get back to is getting back to nature's kingdom, so to speak. Yes, exactly. That's why I'm so highly um, uh, motivated to mention Acres USA, because mm -hmm. all of these deep inroads into the way things actually are are being explored and then reported on in Acres USA. The you know the the difference in taste alone is driving the industry. But if you've got an industry that is increasing 15 to 20 percent a year without fail for the last 20 years, it's like nobody else is coming close to that. Right. Mm, pretty it's amazing like, stuff. How, yeah. How are they managing that? It's not by propaganda. That's for sure. Well, that's it's, good. <laughs> yeah, because it tastes good. <laughs> if you need a lot of ads and a lot of experts coming on telling you why you should do something, that's probably when you should go the different direction. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I heard that they had spent millions of dollars trying to prove to the, to the public that there was no difference between high fructose corn syrup and sugar which was, you know, an absolute lie. Well, of course um, it is, because you actually have to produce <laughs> fructose corn syrup in a laboratory. <laughs> right. And That's not interestingly, natural. <laughs> interestingly, half of what's produced, uh, speaking of dog legs, uh, that um, six-carbon sugar has a little twist in it, and it makes it impossible for the cell to absorb. So it stays in the bloodstream, and then the liver has to clean up this garbage and turn it into something else so that it can either be, so it's possible to burn it as, a, as an energy source or to eliminate it. But that's half of that sugar. And, and the assumption is, oh, well, no one will understand this. You know, we can get away with it. I suppose that's what they're thinking. Or there's, you know, whoever's been assigned to propagandize the, the, the wonderful attributes of uh, astro, at, attributes of high fructose corn syrup is like they don't understand it either. They're just you know I'm, they're paying me to say good things. Okay, I will. Well, like, here's yeah. a good way to look at this too, George. And this is for our listeners out there. Okay, we deem you to be lovely headed and intelligent. If someone else can learn these things, these experts, those they that we're talking about, then so can you. So I absolutely say it's your responsibility to not just passively listen and go with what somebody tells you, because in the end, you've got to live with that result. You have to live with it, not them. So if they can learn this stuff, so can you. And that includes what George does. If he can learn this stuff, so can you. Warren Buffett just said it in a wonderful biography uh, that I was watching about him uh, about a week ago. And he says, look, you can read all the same books that I did. You could do that. It's just that simple. <laughs> right. So, right. Right. Yeah, exactly. crazy. Yeah, and, and you're right. Uh, Alan Burke, who had the whole series, The Day the Universe Changed, 
And, um, and before that, Alan Burke did one called Connections. He said that. He said, there isn't anything you can't understand. All you need to do is read about it and ask questions. And if you can't get the answer easily, go find someone who can answer that question. And it's like, you know, Connections for me was one of the most eye-opening, amazing things that was ever on television. And it was before I quit watching television. Uh, the Day the Universe Changed was another Alan Burke series, and it was like, oh, it was just mind-blowing, all the things that we, we now understand that we didn't understand. For centuries we didn't understand it. Now we do. And you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, that's, that, you know, there isn't anything out there that you can't understand. It, all it takes is asking the right questions and interest and being persistent. Absolutely. Well, George, uh, speaking of persistence, how can people find out about your work? Is there a website, things like that? There is a website. It um, 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 should be geogrowers.net. And if you Google geogrowers, we'll come up. Um, and we, we redid our website, and we're about to start uh, adding things to the blog. Um, got some people who are actually going to take us out of the dark ages when it comes to the social media. Um, so bear with us for a while because, you know, it's, I keep my head, you know, listening to tapes and reading stuff about biology and the molecular reality. So I haven't paid much attention to social media. Well, I but suggest I, one of the big ways you should go is go on YouTube and develop a channel there. I think it would do very, very well. We, Yes, we got just got a YouTube account, and that's what, what we're going to do, exactly. All right, because I know we're going to be posting this on YouTube. So. <laughs> oh, good, yeah. good. In fact, one of our biggest, uh, as we got to wrap this up, uh, one of our biggest videos we produced uh, years ago was uh, How to Grow Giant Vegetables. Boy, that thing just skyrocketed through the roof. We couldn't believe that one, and it still holds oh. its own. And it was just a little 10-minute interview where a guy was talking about growing giant vegetables. So. There's a need, and there's definitely a desire for people out there for this kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, George, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. What a pleasure. What a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I love being here. All right. We love having you as well. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can also discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. Keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.